<laughs> Good plug. <laughs> well done. Great. Well, afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, sticking around. So, although the Comrades Marathon needs no introduction for the South Africans in the audience, we do have a few international guests. So, uh, just to cover that, um, every year, Comrades Marathon, 90 very hilly kilometres between Durban and Peter Marisburg alternates uh, direction every year. Okay, but there are a lot of hills regardless which way you uh, you go. Started in 1921. Uh, as a way by a gentleman called Vic Clapham, as a way to commemorate the fallen comrades from World War I. Um, tremendous growth over the years. Uh, this year, they sold 27,500 entries. They've increased the number of entries to 27,500. They sold out within a week. Okay? Uh, just shows you how many crazy people there are out there in the world. You've got to be careful of those people. Yeah. Um, to put things in perspective, so comrades gets... Uh, uh, around uh, last year was about 17,000 finishers, okay, about 20,000, uh, close to 20,000 starters. There are only about eight ultra marathons in the world which have over 1,000 finishers. Five of them are in South Africa. By far the biggest is the Comrades uh, Marathon. Uh, held in the middle of winter, okay, in June, middle of the South African winter, but for Comrades participants, it's the longest day of the year, I can tell you that. Okay. So really, quite simply, it is the oldest, largest, and greatest ultra-running event on the planet. As for myself, unfortunately, a lot less impressive. I'm not the oldest, I'm not the largest, I'm definitely not the greatest ultra-runner on the planet, unfortunately. Okay. I am, I ever, a guy who just likes to run marathons. I like to run a lot of marathons, not particularly fast. Uh, but, yeah, that's where, where I get my kicks. I've done uh, 10, uh, 10 comrades marathons uh, amongst the 236 marathons and ultras. Uh, that I've done. Thank you. So today I've got three, three objectives. So firstly, I want to use the Comrades Marathon to kill some misconceptions. Secondly, I want to apply Comrades to the Agile Manifesto. And the last thing that I want to do is to prove to you that anyone can run the Comrades Marathon. Okay. Okay, so let's start off by killing some misconceptions. So the first one, okay, it's all about sprinting, okay? What I'm saying is not a sprint, it's a jog. So if you think about what is a sprint, sprints are easy. It's a short burst of energy, after which you've probably doubled over gasping for breath and you can't run anymore. Okay, we're not trying to do that, we actually want to jog. So for our feature teams, we want to do a consistent pace 52 weeks of the year. That is the ideal. At the Comrades Marathon, if you start off too fast, you probably will not finish. Okay? The runners who are winning, leading the race, the TV runners in the first 10 Ks, they don't finish the race. It's very, very, very unlikely that the person leading at the halfway mark will win the race. Also, a lot of them won't even finish the race. If you are running the Comrades Marathon and you want to do well, it's really about even, uh, even pacing. So to illustrate this, these are pictures of the current comrades champions of the up and the down run. And what I'd like to do is to focus on, this, uh, on the lady on the left here, uh, who, who, how she won the, the current uh, down run champion, how she won uh, the down run in 2018. So what you're looking at here is a graph of the top 10 female runners and that the average pace that they did each split in. So comrades have got timing mats and this is the average pace that they completed every split. Anne Ashworth, who won the race, is in the gold over here. You can see she didn't start off the fastest, so she still starts off pretty quick. So she's running about 4 minutes 18 a kilometer in the beginning. She gradually gets faster the entire race. Now, the way the timing mats work, there's a lot more in the second half of the race. So Drummond is at about halfway. Okay? And you can see she actually speeds up the entire way that she, that she, as she goes through the race. Okay? She's the only one who's able to do that and wins the race. And this is a typical pattern that happens. If you had to graph this, I've graphed it in other years as well. Typical pattern uh, that, that happens. Uh, for example, the men's race this year, there were two runners who ran what is called a negative split. Negative split is where you run the second half faster than the first half. And they ran it marginally faster, two minutes, two, sorry, two seconds per kilometer faster over the second half. And they were Bongwusam Temba and Edward Matibi. Uh, who came second and first uh, respectively. Okay? The, the, you have to go all the way down 
to the 83rd place man to find the next person who ran a negative split in the Comrades Marathon. So if you want to achieve optimal performance and win, okay, it's not about sprinting. It's about keeping the same pace and about getting your pace right. In your journeys, in your agility uh, transformations, actually starting out too fast, you're probably going to burn up uh, and uh, run out of energy. So it's about getting that pacing right. The second one, and interestingly enough, this, uh, this featured in the heresy talk as well. Um, so we're always told it's a journey, not a goal. Okay, so yes, there is a definitely a journey component to it. Okay, it is definitely a journey. However, don't neglect your goals. Okay, use goals to help drive your journey. If you do not have goals, you'll end up wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. A lot of people, when they decide to run Comrades, a lot of people watch Comrades on the television. In fact, it's the highest watched live tele sporting event on television outside of a few big soccer games, is the Comrades Marathon. A lot of people watch it, get inspired, and say, I want to run the Comrades Marathon. They pick it as a goal. By the time you get to the start line, even if you started off thinking it was a goal, you've gone on a significant journey at the same time. There are blurred lines. Okay? So it's both a journey and a goal. So getting to the start line, definitely a journey there. Getting to the finish line, okay, but I've got about 200 meters to go there, something like that, okay, definitely a journey there to, to go. What happens after Comrades, once again, is a, is a journey as well. Now, but how do goals actually affect the performance of comrades runners? Okay, so some people think goals are good, some think people think goals are bad. What I'm just going to show you now is how people respond to goals. So what I've done here is I've tracked in 15-minute slots the number of runners who crossed the finish mat at the comrades marathon at last year's comrades. You see a very interesting pattern emerge. It's kind of like a Christmas tree pagoda type pattern. Okay. These love handles that keep cropping up, okay? What's happening there is that there's a medal cutoff. This is a silver medal cutoff at seven and a half hours. So most people, actually more people than even finish all the time before that, come in in that 15 minute slot. At nine hours, you've got the bull row and cutoff. The last 15 minutes, you've got the most runners coming through there. This is a 10 hour Robert Macholi medal. Over here is the bronze medal at 11 hours. And the final cutoff, Okay, which is the uh, Vic Clapper medal at 12 hours. You can see the number of runners who come through in those last 15 minutes. Okay? People respond to goals. 17,000 comrades finishers will uh, tell you that. So interesting enough, what happened is last year's comrades, they introduced a new medal, a 10-hour medal. So when I was uh, a bit younger and faster, I used to be able to get under nine hours. But for many years, I've just said, well, there's no point exerting myself whether I finish 901 or 1059. Um, you know, I'm going to get the same medal. So this year, they introduced a 10-hour medal. What, how, what impact did this have on the comrades field? So what this graph is showing here is it's just tracking the comparative finishes between the 2017 and 2019, the two last upruns. And you'll see very, very similar but there's a couple of deviations happening there, okay? No surprises, that's what the impact of the new 10-hour medal. So just to blow this up, okay, don't worry too much about the details. This is the 10-hour mark. So you can see a significant number of people suddenly run faster, okay? I can tell you it had a big impact, okay? I have never, ever run up poly shorts before. I look forward to a nice long walk at poly shorts. Poly shorts is the most, for those who don't know comrades, the most famous of the hills on the up run. Comes at the end. I ran most of the way up poly shorts. Why did I do it? To get this tiny little medal, okay, under 10 hours, okay? <laughs> so if you're like, looking to motivate your staff, okay, you're looking about intrinsic rewards, you talk a lot about that, Simple things can often make a big difference. And you can see all the gains, a lot of them are lost then by the 11 hours. So you had a significant shift in the speed of the runners. Interesting enough, you have a bit of an improvement at the 9-hour medal as well. So I might be reading too much into this. I think maybe some people thought, okay, well, I'll go for 10. And actually, you know what, I'm having a great day. And they ended up doing a true stretch goal and, and coming in under 9 hours. And at the other side, you might find some people did try for the 10 and probably weren't able to do it and ended up running a bit slow. So really the point here is, often what happens is the stretch goals that we set our teams are ridiculous. They're not stretch goals, they're fairy tales. If you set the right stretch goals, okay, you can get 
lazy, complacent comrades runners like myself to run up poly shorts. And that's really what you want to try and do with your stretch goals. Make them realistic. If you do that, you will get a improvement in the performance uh, of your teams. Okay, so next misconception is not how you start, it's how you finish. Okay, so we're, we often are told that. So my view is not how you start, it's also not how you finish, it's how you deal with the middle. Okay, the middle is the hardest part. Anyone can run the first 30 Ks, in fact, the first half of comrades, anyone can do that, provided you've done a little bit of training. Anyone can run the last 10 Ks, you can see the end is in sight. It's easy to get through those last 10 Ks, you suddenly find more energy, it's amazing. It's that middle section, okay, particularly that last third of the middle section. Comrades Marathon counts down in the markers, just a marathon to go. So you've run, depending on the, the year and the distance, okay, between about 45 to 48, uh, 40, yeah, 43 to 48 kilometers at this stage, okay, and just a marathon to go. It doesn't matter how much training you've done, you are hurting, and this is when you psychologically, your mind starts playing games with you. It just seems unbelievably far and long to get to that distance. Your mind starts playing tricks with you. And that is where most people pull out of comrades. So this graph here, what it's showing is how many people bail at each of the uh, timing mats. So actually, there's quite a small amount. It happens until halfway. Most of the people who pull out of the comrades, uh, pull, pull out of the race, are doing so. Uh, the most is actually happening just after halfway, the highest number by far. So about 608, and I think about just over 2,000 people overall who, who left the field, uh, started and didn't finish. Okay, so really the middle is actually the hardest part. Often we neglect that. That's really what you want to focus on. Okay, it's easy in the start, you've got energy. energy okay? It's easy at the finish, you can see the end is in sight. Okay, you know that you can do it and you can push and persevere. It's that middle section uh, which, which will kill you. Okay, the hardest part is getting started is our next misconception. So yes, getting started often is very, very hard, but the hardest part is to keep going. Okay? Going out for that first jog, that first run, okay, once you're starting to get fit, you're motivated. That's easy. Keeping it going, running five or six days a week when you're tired, when it's cold, it's too hot, when you've just done a conference presentation. Okay? That's what you, but that's what you've got to do is to keep going. It's easy to make excuses and say, no, I'm, you know, I am too tired. Keeping going day in, day out, week in, week out. That is the hardest part of this journey. If you stop, you, you start, uh, you, you, if you stop even for a couple of weeks, you're going, to lose, uh, you're going to lose your fitness. So really the point here is getting lean. It's a lifestyle change. It's not a fad diet. Okay? It's actually reprioritizing and changing your life. When you're tra training for comrades, I always prioritize. If I've got an hour, I make sure I've got an hour and I go for a run. I'm always amazed. The second half of the year, I take things quite a lot easier. Okay, that hour, suddenly I'm filled up with other stuff. I don't know how the hell I found the time to train for comrades in the first half of the year. Okay, so if you really want to, you can find the time, but you've got to prioritize it. So I'm just going to flash through some slides. What I did is on Sunday afternoon, I put out to social media, I said I'm looking for some uh, transformational, some incredible transformations of comrades runners. So I'm just going to flick through some incredible transformations, hopefully give you a bit of inspiration. Okay, so these are people who, before and after pictures. Um, okay, got an Australian one for you there, Evan. But incidentally, the hardest thing, I ran a few kilometers with some Australian runners uh, last year, just chatting away to them. Comrades is hard. The hardest way to run comrades is in an Australian shirt. So the <laughs> amount of times over those two kilometers I heard the word sandpaper used, okay, was, yeah. <laughs> My ears are still burning. Okay, the one there. Okay, gentleman over here, he uh, is running two hour, 40 minute marathons now. Okay, incredible. Okay, so some truly incredible uh, transformations over there. Now, the interesting thing here, we've talked about how businesses are all different. You can't apply the same, you can't apply Spotify to every single business, it's not going to work. So the stories of these people are all fascinating. Okay, we could spend a lot of time dis discussing them, and I love the running stories of, of, of different people. Uh, they're very inspirational. How they've achieved their transformation is very, very different. How they've approached it, how they run, what they run, what they eat, are they cross-training, all of those kind of things. But there's one common factor 
that they've all had a major lifestyle change. Okay? And really that is what, uh, for me, the transformation to, to agility is about. Okay. So apparently you've got to throw in an inspirational quote into these speech to have any credibility, so here's my one. So I've chosen a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, and he says the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Now also we're told we're supposed to relentlessly improve things, so I like to relentlessly improve quotes. So I've tried here by saying, but a transformational journey requires 10,000 steps every day. <laughs> and the good news there is that you get a free coffee from Discovery Vitality if you do your 10,000 steps every day. Okay. So now I'm going to look at uh, what I'm calling the running manifesto. So let's read, well, how does the, running, how does the uh, Agile manifesto apply to the Comrades Marathon? So responding to change over following a plan. We, everyone who goes into Comrades, they start off with a plan. Uh, you can buy these pacing bands, you clip them around your wrist, it tells you where you should be at what time, so on and so forth. For a lot of runners, the danger is actually going out too fast, to relating back to that point earlier. Not, not going too slowly, going too fast. Um, you can even get uh, temporary tattoos to put them on your arm. And I've seen runners write in permanent marker, they've got, got things over there uh, on there. Now, plans are great, okay, but what happens? You can control some things, you can't control everything. This is looking at the finishing percentage uh, for this, uh, for since the year 2000, the number of people who start the race who actually finish. And it's normally around the mid 80s, occasionally in the 90%, somewhere, somewhere around that. There's one big anomaly, 2013. Okay, so what happened there? Fortunately, none of us can control the weather. Okay, so there were the, were the most adverse weather conditions this, this millennium uh, happened in 2013. So it actually started off quite a cool morning, it was an uprun, but it was quite windy. That wind got higher and higher into gale force, and it got to over 30 degrees. So you had this hot berg wind blowing through there. Now, what should have happened is that people should have adjusted their plans. But unfortunately, about half the field were not able to. So 45% of the people who started didn't, weren't able to finish the race. Okay? And a large part of those were because they didn't adjust their plan. They tried to keep on at the same pace, and they probably could for a certain period of time. And after that, the conditions were just so hard that they ended up uh, either um, uh, you know, you know, just not, not, not making it having, and having to withdraw from the race. Okay. So very important, uh, we are the ability to respond to change. Same thing's going to happen. There are going to be a lot of things which are outside of your control. Make sure you adjust your plan. Don't blindly carry on with the same goals, okay, the same targets. Okay. Otherwise, uh, you will need to withdraw from the race as well. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Okay, if you Google... Essential running gear, you'll get pictures like this. That's what I did. Okay, what do you really need? Protection, <laughs> protection, Vaseline, and a good pair of running shoes. Okay, incidentally, I'm told that if you're looking for love in the West Rand, the same applies. <laughs> okay. And in actual fact, the running shoes are optional, as you see here. There's some people who can run comrades uh, bare barefoot. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So really here what I'd like to do is to focus on the role of leadership. Um, so I'm just going to ask a question, shout out your answers. Who is your customer? So most people in the room are leaders. I've been observing obviously the talks previously. So who is your customer? Policy holders? Shareholders? System people on the street? Okay. So the one thing I haven't heard, and because we had, I don't have a lot of time, I would actually ask you to write this down. I would be surprised if anyone said the people who report to me, to me okay, my feature teams. Okay, does anyone have that in their head when I ask that question? Now, if you think about it, if your customer is whoever consumes your work, okay, the output of your leadership is going to be impact your teams. They are the ones who are going to consume your work. So really, I think that there needs to be much more of a focus on your teams and the people who report to you as your actual customer. Okay, how would that change your approach? So the next question I'm going to ask is, are you an athlete? Okay, so I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Probably for most people in the room, it's not. Have you written a line of code this year which has either gone into production or the potential to go into production or an automated test case or anything like that? For most people in the room, probably, is there anyone in the room, by the way, who's written a line of code this year that's likely to go into production in a work, work scenario? So, okay, so most people in the room are not athletes. So athletes are the only ones who are able to win you medals. So if you're not an athlete, your job 
is to create the structure and environment for your athletes to be successful. Simple as that. Okay, that is what your job is. You're the only people who can change the system, enable the, your athletes to be successful. There's an easy way to test this. Okay? Ask, think, and maybe this thing flying into your head right now, fantastic. Okay? Maybe you're struggling. Okay? Maybe something pops into your head on the way home. Okay? Two things you did in the last six months to make your team's life easier. I've actually started asking teams this, okay? and I've yet to get an answer back from teams. You're like, oh, sure, there must be something. Okay, if you really want to measure, okay, that's how you can see how you're doing as a leader. So, what does this mean in a context environment? So, this is actually something I've not shown before. Um, it's something I'm busy actually studying and writing an article about what, what, this, what this means and why this is. So, what I have done here is I've tracked since the dawn of democracy in South Africa as to, who, uh, as to gold medal uh, winners. Top 10 get a gold medal. So, no surprises in this graph. You'll see black African men dominate the top 10 positions at the Comrades Marathon, okay? A few international runners, a few uh, runners from other African countries as well. And the bad news for white dudes like me, we're actually not so great. We apparently can't jump. According to the Americans, we're not so good at ultra running either. The last time a white guy, won, won a, uh, white South African won a gold medal was in, uh, over 10 years ago. Okay, so, but no surprises there. It represents the demographics of, the, of, the, of, the, of our country. So the same graph here on women paints a very bit different picture. You can see who dominates the medal standings. White South African women international runners. Even rarer than a white dude like myself winning a gold medal is an African, black African lady. In fact, there's only been two in the whole history of comrades who've won gold medals. Now, this is very interesting for me. So as I said, I'm busy studying. I'm, um, I'm busy writing an article about this, chatting to a lot of the elite um, runners, asking them for you know, why, why they think this is. And at the risk of oversimplifying the problem, a lot of this is about the support that you need to be a successful ultra runner. If we had to do this graph at a 10K, it would be very, very different. Okay? As you go up in distances to marathon, you start seeing that it changes and changes. The amount of support you need to be a successful ultra runner okay, is just vastly different. The amount of training you need to do, the amount of injury prevention, diet, nutrition becomes just so much, much more important. Okay. Doing our agile transformations, our business agility transformations, it's going to require support. Who needs to give that support? Leaders, the people in this room. So make sure you're taking care of your athletes. If you don't, they are not going to be, perform, be able to perform at their optimal. So, I firmly believe we don't have a talent problem. We heard that earlier in the first talk today from John. Our people, okay, regardless of gender or ethnicity, we are just as capable and clever as our international counterparts. What we've got is a talent enablement problem. Being able to realize the potential of our people is what we want to focus on. Okay, and then the last one, working software over comprehensive documentation. So, a very, very simple one here, get out and run. Okay. Conferences are great. Stimulating conversation, uh, meetups, podcasts, reading, fantastic new ideas. But it means nothing unless you can actually go and put it into practice. Okay, so get out and run. Actually try it. See, find out what works for you and what doesn't. Okay, so what I'd like to conclude with now is can anyone run the comrade? So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you either have been part of a successful transformation already, uh, business agility transformation already, or if you think that you can be part of a, a successful agility transformation, please could you stand up? Okay. Okay, so that's pretty much almost everyone in the room. Okay, so one or two people not, but pretty much. Okay, so you can sit down again. Okay. So, and this is the last, the last question I'm going to ask you. So, Stand up if you either have already successfully completed the Comrades Marathon or you think that you can complete the Comrades Marathon. Please stand up. Okay. Cool. Great. So it's a lot less people. Okay, so thanks, thanks, sir. You can sit down again now. Okay, so what I'm taking from that is business agility transformations are hard. The Comrades Marathon is harder. Okay, so how can I prove to you every, anyone can run the Comrades Marathon? Okay, um, <clears throat> fascinating story. Um, this is a guy called uh, Nolani Livona. He started, they gave him about a, an early start. He started around midnight. Um, he completed the Comrades Marathon. He's got one leg on crutches in 15 hours and 50 minutes. Okay, fascinating story behind this. He lost his leg to bone cancer. He's a 
former convict, convicted criminal. He was living under a bridge and was a drug addict. Okay. The gentleman just on the left there got chatting to him one day in the car. He was begging. And cut a very long story short, they ended up running Comrades Marathon together. Okay. So the message I'd like to leave you with today is no matter what your role, no matter how, how, how hard things get on the road to your business agility transformation, okay. remember that a one-legged, formerly homeless drug addict was able to complete the Comrades Marathon. Okay, and use that as motivation to pick yourself up and uh, persevere uh, in, that, in that journey. Thank you very much.